Hey there, planet Earth. What's up? Today is the 20th of July, 2019, as of recording this, and it's a very special day today. Today marks the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landings. Half a century ago, human beings achieved perhaps what is the most remarkable thing to have ever been achieved by human beings so far, and that is we were able to set foot on planet Earth's only natural satellite, the moon. 50 years ago, on July 20th, 1969, at about 2017 UTC, Coordinated Universal Time, human beings would take their first steps out onto an alien world. After traveling more than a quarter of a million miles in a cramped little spacecraft, these human beings, three went, but two would step out onto a world that, to quote Neil Armstrong, who was the first man on the moon, a world full of beautiful desolation. A world that had previously only existed in the realm of myth and legend, but with science and engineering and pure guts, those astronauts made that moon and the Soviet space program their bitch. America, fuck yeah! I kid, I kid, they came in peace for all mankind. I mean, it says so on the plaque they left behind. Now, I'm sure you've probably heard a lot about this from the news that's been going on about the Apollo 50 anniversary, but that's not what I want to talk about in this video. Uh, for this video, I want to talk about this book, Artemis by Andy Weir. I happen to have finished this book recently in conjunction with this whole Apollo 50 anniversary thing, so I figured, why not make a review video of this book? I did name drop this book in a TED talk that I gave, links down below. That was a shameless self-plug. And this book, Artemis, takes place in the near future, following the next 50 years of lunar exploration in the year 2080. And it's not the distant future, but the near future, so there's a lot of plausibility behind the story and it takes place on the moon in a city called Artemis which is the only city on the moon at the time and this city Artemis is named after the Greek goddess and now across human mythology there have actually been many lunar gods and goddesses for example Apollo which is actually the brother of Artemis and from other cultures all across the globe you have the Chinese with the moon goddess Chang'e, and in Hinduism you have the moon god Chandra. Coincidentally, uh, the Chinese Space Agency and the Indian Space Agency is all named their lunar moon exploration space programs after these gods, the Chang'e and Chandrayaan. And Chandrayaan is about to have, um, they're going to launch Chandrayaan rocket in the next two days, which should be interesting. They named their space programs to explore the moon after the gods and goddesses of mythology respectively and I like to think of these space programs as uh, human beings carving out their own future mythology. These stories of these new gods and goddesses are the stories that we will tell to our descendants once we are arrayed out there in the solar system. The stories of these iron metal chariots that carried human beings to the moon. That is an awesome mythology indeed but it's also not just mythology, it's reality. So that's something to get excited about and something to think about. But anyway, I want to review this back to the book. Um, I'll try to keep the spoilers to a minimum because I always recommend people to go out there and read the books themselves. And this book is a pretty good work of hard science fiction. What is hard science fiction? Uh, that doesn't mean it's science fiction that it's more difficult to understand or anything like that or that it's more boring compared to soft science fiction. It's just science fiction uh, flavored with uh, more realism and more scientific accuracy, which can also be fun. If you think of like Star Wars at one end of the spectrum and uh, Star Trek at towards the other end, hard science fiction would actually be even farther than Trek right here and it would be more distant than Trek. And these hard science fiction works would include things like Larry Niven's Ringworld, Arthur C. Clarke's Rama, and 
Isaac Asimov's iRobot. Hard science fiction may appear daunting at first, and I admit there's quite a barrier of entry to this stuff, but once you get into it, it's pretty amazing because it really connects with this reality that we live in, more than the soft stuff like 40K or Star Wars, especially since, for me, since I am a man of science, I'm a person that's uh, on a path to becoming a scientist, a radio astronomer actually, that's why I'm here in New Zealand right now, I'm studying to become a radio astronomer. And hard, sci hard science fiction is more mind-opening. It made me realize that gravity is a cruel mistress indeed. Now back to Artemis. Uh, it's a city on the moon, which is pretty amazing to think about it. It's a very small city made of interconnected domes. Let's put that up on the screen. And the location of Artemis City is actually near where the Apollo astronauts landed 50 years ago in the Sea of Tranquility. And part of the city is underground, which uh, makes sense actually, because according to the real science, that there, is, there are lunar lava tubes on the moon, which are these subsurface tunnels carved out by lava flow on the moon a long time ago. And any plausible, viable lunar colonization would do well to take advantage of these lunar lava tubes as, uh, because they're naturally occurring phenomena that would offer you protection from the radiation of outer space. Just like how early humans lived in caves, early loonies would learn to live in tunnels before reclaiming more and more of the surface of the surface above. Now Artemis City has a population of 2,000 like that, which is very small. It's a very small lunar city. And Auckland, for example, has a population of 1 million uh, compared to Artemis, so that's like 500 times smaller than Auckland. Artemis City has its own economy built on tourism and casinos and hotels and guided tours of the Apollo 50 landing site. So think of it like Vegas in space, but it's more like Carson City, Nevada on the frontier like that. What I like about the city of Artemis in this story is that people who live on the moon have their own specific trades and professions. You start seeing cultures and societal enclaves start to emerge around certain professions. And Artemis is a very multicultural city. For example, the, the Vietnamese who live there all manage the life support systems. The Saudis who live there, they're all welders. And the Latinos own smelting. And the Hungarians are responsible for building the, the dome city itself. But the Kenyans, man, the Kenyans, they own the whole shebang. I like how the author built up the Kenyan Space Agency as part of the story because what Kenya provided to the building of the city is actually the equator on Earth. Kenya sold its position near the equator to launch rockets to reach the moon. Because if you launch a rocket eastwards near the equator, you actually end up saving a bit of fuel true story like a form of giant planetary catapult so the story in this book follows the adventures of this Saudi girl who lives on the moon her name is Jasmine Jazz Bashara the daughter of Amar Bashara who was a welder and she is ostracized by her father for being a slutty mix slut slut oh, among other things you just have to read the book to find out but Think of jazz as like a brown skin, mean girl's Lindsay Lohan, but with the intellect of, with a Dexter-like intellect. And she's meant to be very smart and a sassy girl. And that, that smarts and resourcefulness, which is really something crucial that you need to survive on the moon, it actually plays a big part in her adventures. And I almost, I almost thought that the main character was a bit of a Mary Sue because of her intellect and she pretty much had because she pretty much had a solution for everything all the predicaments that she would get herself in she would immediately like that have an answer to it and there was this one clear Mary Sue moment where she had to fight off a cartel hitman but then I realized that a lot of the the reason that she gets into those situations is because of her own right not so bright idea so I guess that kind of balances it out that kind of makes up for it and there are in this book there are two interweaving narratives that happen uh, one is the main story and the other one is told in the form of letters and correspondences to a person who works for Kenyan Space Agency one of Jazz's friends I like how these two plot lines kind of cro cross 
in the middle of the book and it explains exactly how Jazz became a smuggler, which was pretty awesome. I would totally, I mean, Han Solo is a smuggler, right? She has Han Solo's job. How awesome is that? What I like about the story is that it's a rags to riches story set to the tone of a crime caper. And it's kind of like a heist story. The main character tries to pull off the perfect heist, but then it goes wrong and that's where the ball gets rolling. But it would have been more interesting if the author had actually fleshed out more of the criminal underworld of this Moon City Artemis. I mean, Artemis is set up as this city where anything goes, but we don't really see much of the seedier parts of town. Well, there are mentions of it, like prostitution, but I would have liked to have seen more of the criminal underworld of a potential city on the moon, the moon mob. That would be totally awesome DJ name right there. Uh, because the, the criminal underworld is marketed as the big bad in this story, but they didn't really get much exposure. That's probably because it would have raised the page count and it's already, it's decently sized as it is. Uh, as far as hard sci-fi goes, Artemis is pretty light and easy. It's meant to be a speedy read, but that wraps up in three distinct arcs. Uh, and all the technology actually in this book doesn't really go too far from reality. I mean, all the stuff in Artemis is, are things that have already been invented in real life probably exist on some NASA drawing board locker room of ideas and if you're interested in chemical or mechanical engineering do give this one a read or you could just wait for the movie I'm pretty sure they're making one pretty soon so Artemis I give it a 4.2 out of 5 now beyond being a story about engineering and physics and the moon, Artemis is actually a story about economics and you actually learn about how economics works at the end of the book. I certainly did. It even explains, the, uh, they even have the owner of the moon city kind of like outright explain and discuss how economies work. First you have the lawless capitalism and expansion, then you have the regulation and law enforcement and taxes, and then comes the public benefits and entitlements and then after a lot of over expenditure comes the collapse and this collapse results in a bunch of smaller economies and then you start that cycle process over again and this is the same thing that happens for nation states as well but on a much longer time scale it all history repeats itself and economics is actually the underlying reason that the character Jazz Bashara gets their call to adventure Hashtag get rich or die trying, hashtag earn that dollar, hashtag hustle, yo. What I learned from this book is that if we are to return to the moon in the next 50 years, there must be a prime economic incentive that would motivate us to do so. We went there 50 years ago for political reasons, then came back like a child taking their first steps out into the cosmic ocean and then returning to the skirts of the mother planet. Once it was discovered that there were no Russians, missiles on the moon, America saw no reason to go any further. I kind of wish they had found Soviets on the moon, then the race would have continued onwards to Mars and Jupiter and beyond. Now imagine a science fiction story taking place on a fictional planet with more than one moon and a never ending space race. That would be cool, but yeah. I digress. After reading Artemis, I learned that there are actually a lot of resources that you can get from the moon. And for example, there's, there are rare earth metals like titanium. There are minerals like calcium, silicon, and aluminum, and oxygen that can be extracted from aluminum smelting. And all of this is found in this lunar rock called anorthite, available in the highlands of the moon. It's a real rock, you can go check it out, anorthite. And uh, it's, there's very little of it on Earth, but on the moon there's a lot of it. There's water to be found on the poles, and there are, there's a lot of energy to be harvested through solar panels because there's no atmosphere. The photons of light get in much easier. And you can actually beam that energy back to Earth, just an idea. And all the space enthusiasts that I know are always going on about helium-3, which is the fuel of the future once we unlock nuclear fusion. If we do not destroy ourselves we will most likely 
unlock the power of nuclear fusion and then we will destroy ourselves with nuclear fusion <laughs> but I digress again the problem is getting all of that good stuff from the moon back to earth and the reason why private companies are not cashing out on moon mining is because the cost of getting it back here is far more than the profit you make by selling it on earth and that goes the same for asteroid mining we still have a long way to go but I think in order to truly maximize the impact of the resources that the moon provides is by using the moon as a form of a way station as an R&R &R on the way to Mars and on that lunar R&R &R of the future I imagine there would be a little gift shop opened by a Persian American couple selling model trinkets of all the spacecraft that have since flown humans to the moon like the model aircraft that you get at airport gift shops and the first item lining that lunar gift shop store shelf would be a miniature model of the Apollo 11 rocket the first spacecraft that carried humans there 50 years ago that's all from me Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.